This is Reaganism, a podcast dedicated to exploring where the Reagan movement lives today. I'm Roger Zakheim, director of the Ronald Reagan Institute in Washington, D.C. On this episode of Reaganism, Reagan Institute Policy Director Rachel Hoff sits down with Nilafar Ayubi, who is an Afghan activist, journalist, and entrepreneur who escaped Afghanistan shortly after the Taliban takeover in August 2021. They discuss the situation for women in Afghanistan today, Nilafar's individual story, and the prospects for the future of Afghanistan. Well, hello and welcome to Reaganism. I'm your guest host, Rachel Hoff, and our guest today is Nilafar Ayubi, a businesswoman, an entrepreneur, and an advocate for women's rights from Afghanistan, who was forced to flee after the Taliban takeover in 2021. Nilafar, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you so much. It's an honor. You know, when I think about President Reagan's legacy in today's world, I'm I'm so inspired by people like you who are really on the on the leading edge uh, of the struggle for freedom and for for human rights around the world. And I thought we'd start our conversation, Nilafar, just by uh, defining a key term for our audience. So you you speak and and have been so involved uh, in the fight for women's rights in Afghanistan. And I thought it might be useful for our audience just to. Um, tell us what you mean by that. Of course, the, the term women's rights has, has has such a particular meaning in, in every context in which it's used. And we use that term in America and in, in Europe, where you are now in the West. Um, but in unfree societies, it tends to mean something quite different than the context of the free world. So when you speak about women's rights in the context of Afghanistan, what do you mean? Uh, well, it's pretty simple. When you go to Afghanistan, what we mean by women's rights is to be simply, um, you know, exist, to be seen as human beings, not just merry objects or vessels uh, uh, of production and then and, and objects to be kept in a corner of a home or just servants. Uh, we just want to be treated as we are born, like as a woman. I am born as a woman and I would like to live as a woman. But at the same time, I was born as a human, which uh, in, in, in my country, um, in, the, in the male patriarchal societies, they tend to forget that uh, as a woman, I am much more capable and powerful than they can think. I am the woman who is the creator. I am the woman who bore these, these children for the nine months in my stomach, and I, even the men are born from me. But instead, they just see me as, you know, a merry object, uh, a tool of, you know, just throwing here and there like a, like, like a toy you give into a children's hand. I do not have a right to my name. I do not have a right to my child. Uh, 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 I mean, my name is nowhere to be seen in my child's birth certificate. I am born nameless. I am raised nameless. And I die nameless. There is no name in my tombstone. So that's what human rights means for us. You mentioned uh, what it is to be be a woman in in Afghanistan, particularly under the Taliban rule, and and that you were you were born a woman, uh, but you experienced something quite different in your childhood, even during the time of Taliban rule, than other young women, young girls at the time. Tell us a little bit about the way that that you grew up. Well, I was grew, I, I grew up as a bacha push. Bacha push is a term for women in Afghanistan who have to sacrifice their womanhood and dress as a boy, pretend to be a boy, and also be careful not to be caught, um, just in order to provide for their families. Because during the course of 40 years of war, many family doesn't have a male in the family to provide a male provider. And under the Taliban's law, in the Sharia law, a, 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 a teeny tiny boy, even as young as three, four years, have more respect than a grown woman or an older woman. So you have to have that boy if you want to step outside your home, if, to, if you want to do, go just for the grocery shopping. But in my case, it was a little bit different. I did have my older brother. But just to experience life, just to not miss on those little bit, you know, humanity that men under Taliban experience. My father decided that I will be dressing as a boy, so I do not miss out on anything. 
And what did that what did that allow you to do that other other girls your age were not able to do? Well, I was able to play outside. Uh, I was able to go to the market. I was able to accompany my father um, to the places where it was impossible for my sisters to even imagine to be in. Um, I remember that I would go with my father to a Buskashi game, which is a national game in Afghanistan, a national sport, where hundreds and thousands of men come to watch it, but women will be nowhere to see. So I enjoyed those little freedoms, which seems very little, but that's, that makes quite a lot of difference. And most importantly, I, did not, I was not forced to sit at home learn the womenly course, you know, to sew, to wash, to clean, you know, to become a servant. That allowed me not to be a servant, but instead also gave me this power of, you know, being a man. And then I was the man when my mother would go to a market and I would be leading my mother when I was like such a young child. So, yeah, it's now that I think it was quite sad, but I enjoyed that freedom. I enjoyed leading my mother, me, a, a small child, you know, dictating my mother. Okay, if you don't buy me this, I'm going to leave you alone and run back so the Taliban hit you. The morality police catches, you know, this small um, naughtiness in the children. But now when I go back and think, I feel so bad for my mother that she bore me and then I was the one leading him just because I was dressed as a boy. It sounds like every child's dream in some ways to, to be able to control a parent, but it's so much deeper than that, as, as you describe, mm -hmm. and, and the situation that, that that put your mother and so many, so many other women in Afghanistan in. Um, when, when you became older, of course, um, uh, it was impossible to hide the fact that you are a woman. And uh, you, you uh, went on to live as a young woman in Afghanistan and, and really spoke out in favor of, of women's rights, of, of human rights, um, in the context of, of, a, of a really conservative and, and obviously, especially under the Taliban, a very controlled, oppressive society. Um, can you tell us a bit about sort of, you know, you, I'm sure you understood the risks that you faced when you were speaking out, uh, what happens to women who's, who speak out in societies like this. Where did you find the courage to, to continue to speak out and to, to begin your, your activism? Well, to be honest, um, I know I come from a patriarchal society, male-dominant society, but for me, everything came from my father. My father was such a great um, part of my life that if I am who I am today, it's because of him. He was a very educated man. He was an educator himself, despite coming from a background of um, quite... Uh, um, how should I say it? He did not need money uh, to, to, to survive, so he could have just sit in his luxurious life and, and enjoy, and, but he decided that he would become an educator and live as an ordinary man. That's what he taught us, that be as ordinary as possible, but at the same time, do not give up on your rights. And be it if you're a girl or if you're a boy, it, is, it doesn't matter. You're equally as human beings. And that's where um, I got my courage because whenever I would create a chaos in school, um, I would pray that they would call my father, not my mother. <laughs> because when it was my father, it would, it would go quite in my favor. But when it was my mother, of course, mothers are more concerned about the daughter's future. Um, so it would be... I would be grounded for sure. But at the end of the day, I think both of them did a great job raising all, all of us, our siblings. Um, and it was not easy, not for them and not for me. I have been name called, I have been labeled at, uh, at a young age of as young as 13, just because I wasn't uh, um, the typical woman in the society just because I was uh, questioning and challenging some of the narratives and taboos in the society, just because I would ask too many questions from my teachers in school, that why this is this and this is that, why women are not equal, especially 
when it was our um, religious uh, lessons every day in school, um, I would ask questions that normally it would be called blasphemy in such societies. Um, but because my father was a well-known educator, so they would they would not put me into this, you know, field court, but they will warn my father from time to time that your daughter is going to get all your family killed. So it was not easy, but I'm happy that my father stood firm and strong behind me. How old were you when the Taliban was, was overthrown after, after U.S. and allied intervention in Afghanistan? Well, I was quite young. I think, in two, I, as I said, I'm, I'm born in 1996, just when Taliban took over. So um, I think I was five years old when they were overthrown. Um, but Taliban was overthrown in 2000. The society, however, the Taliban mentality, it took years for us to, to change that. And we were not even halfway there when everything was snatched from us, unfortunately. Not even halfway there, but but those 20 years between before 2021 must have been must have been so different for for you, for your family, for your mother, uh, for your father and your friends. What what was that time like? Relatively speaking, more freedom, more opportunity. How how even if things changed slowly, what what started to change? Well, to be honest, it was like when, when uh, um, you know, when these, for the first time, these black and white TVs turned into color, it was exactly the same situation for us. Um, life, even the air we smelled, felt more, brought more hope for us, more, you know, good news. There was hope that, okay, first good news was school. That we could, I could go to school. I could. Uh, girls were allowed to go to school. There were nobody to stop girls from walking on the street. Uh, of course, we would be covered, but at least our faces were showing. Um, and year by year, this, uh, you know, the, the the it's the spring was getting closer and closer and closer, and um, so much opportunity, so much potential, so many young girls' life changed for better. So many women's life changed for better. So many, um, uh, I think hundreds of women got graduated from schools, thousands of graduated from universities, so many jobs for women. And we were growing quite uh, fast. I don't know if we had this feeling that we have a very short time, so we got to try everything, but everybody was in a rush. So fast forward to 2021, um, half of, I, mean, I would say 60% of the market, at least in Kabul, was taken over by women in the business. Um, women were uh, in, in the media, women in business, women um, in the health services, women in the um, security forces, women in the government. So also we had relatively overcome the situation that women were slowly taking the lead. I know that it was tough for the men, but, you know, men... We were in a situation that in social media, no men would dare to say anything misogynistic, anything, you know, uh, against women. And everybody would try to be well behaved, you know, respect women's rights. Um, but uh, as I said, it didn't last long. When the government of Afghanistan collapsed in 2021, you know, the eyes of America, the eyes of the world were, were on the situation un unfolding, uh, particularly in Kabul, particularly at the airport. Um, you, of course, had a, a front row seat to that chaos, being somebody who, who had spoken up um, during those, those times uh, when the Taliban was not in control um, and had built such a career for, for yourself and as a, as a businesswoman and an entrepreneur. Um, what were those days like for you in, in 2021 as, as the government started to fall? Well, um, I think 
Aman prior we felt the the the, the chaos when when the uh, provinces were falling back to back. But to be honest, personally, I was so naive that I had never thought that we would be back to the Stone Age. I was so confident of the development of the investment that had been made in Afghanistan that none of us thought that we would be left like that. Because we thought, no, nobody comes, you know, in your country spend so, so much, invest so much, and uh, not only that, you know, sacrifices so many soldiers in this war, and then it would be impossible, to, you know, to let those sacrifices go in vain. And that was part of, you know, assurance for us that, okay, maybe there will be a little bit of clashes. We have the strongest army. Um, it will be fine. We will survive. And everybody was calling. Uh, my friends, my family kept asking leave Afghanistan like a month or two prior. I said, well, where, where am I going to go? This is my home. And I started giving interviews. And my interviews are there that if Taliban wants to come now, I feel sad. And also I feel um, ashamed because I didn't stood on my words uh, that if they want to come, they have to accept me as who I am and I will continue working. And at that time, I really did not think that, okay, I chose this path, but my children has nothing to do with this situation. And I'm putting them in danger. And for what? And we didn't know that we were going to face such a betrayal. Um, but unfortunately, it happened even the, the morning of August 15. Um, we were continuing the normal life. We, we, we went, my, my staff was at work. I went to ID office. We, we had our breakfast. Girls were in school. When I, when I left home and saw that girl, little girls in uniform coming out of school, like it was a normal day. And when it happened, it's like, I'm still in shock. It's been two in, uh, two years and few months. I, still think that everything was just a nightmare. And um, I don't know how I got the strength. I don't know how I gathered myself to survive that very moment and what happened after and what's been happening so far. Uh, it's it's, it's uh, catastrophic for me. Well, the images, you know, were are stuck with, with us uh, who, who were only watching on TV. And I can only imagine um, how much more traumatic it was for, for, for you and so many others who were living it as your, as your day to day during, during that time. And, and um, you, you did, you were able to flee Afghanistan. Um, so many did, uh, others were not able to, can you talk a little bit about what that, what that was like for you, how, how you were able to leave and, and um, maybe even some of those, um, those moments from, from the days that, that I'm sure that that future wasn't exactly, exactly clear once, once even you, you had the idea that, that you did need to leave. Well, um, I did try to, to stay as long as I can. I was, uh, I just, went into hiding so to see the situation what's gonna happen and then they started going to my office to my showroom to my warehouses and because everywhere is you know equipped with the security cameras and i could see it in my mobile that's when i started to panic because um, it was tough i had to take my children to safety and I thought, okay, let's, let's do something. Let's get these children to safety. And then maybe I would be able to go back and continue the fight because at the same time I was leading this group of women protesters and we were planning, um, protests on the streets of Kabul. Um, but, uh, by then, I wasn't into any evacuation list because I had never affiliation with any international NGOs, foreign entity. I was a self-made entrepreneur and a journalist. Um, but during my interviews, uh, one of the journalists from Poland said, "You are you into any list? I said, no. 
and I was and I refused to go to airport just without any confirmation because I have three kids and they were little. The youngest was 11 months old, so it was impossible to to just go there and then anything could have happened. Um, this journalist put me into the list and said, "Just I received the." message around one in the morning and said, just two backpacks, your children and at the airport, be at the Abbey Gate. Um, and uh, it's not easy. You work 20 plus years for a life, uh, which you built from bricks. And then they ask you to fold it in, in just two backpacks and your children and leave. And at that time, and I, it's it's whenever I talk about it, I get emotional, is that um, I didn't know what to do. I didn't know. I, I was like, I wanted to get to safety because of my children as soon as possible. But at the same time, in my heart, I said, I wish I don't make it. Because uh, at the end, I would be able to tell my children I tried, but I couldn't. So I stay back in the country if anything happens. It was a long three days of of hustle to each. Do you know? I always watched um, these apocalyptic movies from Hollywood. I thought, no, it's there, there's no such thing. Even if the world is going to end, people, human beings are not so cruel to one another. They do not clamp each other. You know, they do not just step on each other to reach to a safety, but when I reached to the airport, I saw that with my own eyes. I saw women being, you know, run over and women dying because women, of course, it's not only running away. You have to cover yourself with these black things and face cover. And it's August. It's 40 degree uh, um, heat. And then you once you're stuck in the middle of these humans of, I think, 100 a thousand plus people were there. Then there's no back, no forward. If you, you get suffocated, you die. And I saw people dying. My poor children, they were feeling, you know, one after other, they would feel unconscious. And then we had to pour water on them and then wake them up. It's, it's such a vivid uh, memory that I have there that, um, to be honest, I... My coping mechanism is that I try to forget bad things. But this one I can't. This is impossible. And if that wasn't bad enough, we were called, we were recognized by Taliban. And one of them just pulled my husband and put gun on his head that um, they wanted to kill him, shoot, shoot him down, because he was head of the one of the biggest media groups, private media sectors in Afghanistan, movie group, for a long time. Um, so he was also on the hit list. He was also very much wanted. Um, and then I started begging and crying, please, I, we are living our house, our life, earned money, everything for you, our country for you, just let us go. I have three children, please don't do this. And then my kids... Um, screaming my son and daughter that please don't kill my mother don't kill my father and then they hit me very hard with the back of this gun AK-47 I think they broke my nose and, and they started shooting like one inch above our heads and I, I remember my kids screaming and I thought I'm dead uh, for a moment I blank out I didn't know what happened and then apparently some other Talib guy pulled this one and said, and, 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 and partially said, let's go, let's go, this is not the time, just let them die, let them go. And uh, when I opened my eyes, I was looking if my children are hurt, if my husband is hurt, if I'm hurt, and luckily we weren't hurt, but my children, I think for months they would scream in their uh, sleep. They would be sleeping and suddenly start screaming and running around the house. That's the trauma that it left. It took uh, my children therapy, a lot of months of therapy for them to, to forget that thing. Um, but for me, because I couldn't uh, 
it was only me and my family. I left my mother and family behind. So, to be honest, every single night, I am still at the airport. And I am still trying to cross that hell, and somehow I don't make it. Um, because deep down, um, after I left, my family has been tortured immensely. And this is the first time I'm talking uh, on media about it because um, I had to keep on a brave face. Um, my mother was tortured so much that her collarbone was broken. Uh, my elder brother was tortured and dragged. Um, my younger brother... Um, I, I can only share this much uh, that that it's 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 my my family is suffering back in Afghanistan, but um, it is what it is. I cannot. My father taught me that never to stay silent in, in the face of injustice. So here I am. Well, as much as much trauma as as you had to endure to leave, you know, hearing about the trauma of of those who who stayed is is so impactful and and poignant as as well um what's what's life like in afghanistan today for those those who didn't leave or or couldn't leave for the women i don't think there's any life left um it's it's horrible you know if if you haven't experienced this freedom before, it's easier for you to to survive. But once you have seen it, you have tasted it, and then being pushed back inside homes, it's like each one of these women feel that they're in solitary confinement, that nobody is there to listen to them. They're um, so much. They feel so much lonely that. You know they're trying to convince themselves that yeah this is this is life as a woman that I have to accept, but at the same time there are many many women who are committing suicide with the lack of independent media on the ground and not proper reporting. Many things goes by un unreported and unnoticed. Um, life is. I don't know how to explain, but it's like when you put a, 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 you know, it's like putting a human being alive inside a casket and letting them suffocate and die slowly. It's like being in this casket that you cannot break free. You're scratching, you're screaming, you're, you know, panicking, and there's no one, absolutely no one who cares or who, who, who can help you. This is how women feel. And with the women that I am in contact, I have my young cousins who are deprived of education now in Afghanistan. Uh, some of them have been chased by Taliban in a, for, the, for a forced marriage. So they had to flee from one city to another city. And this is how women have to, you know, families have to hide their young girls. So... Any Talib commander doesn't find out that there is a young, beautiful girl because they will snatch it from them. And not just in a respectful manner, just third, four, five, six, seven wife. Just like tools, just like, you know, the, the eras of the, I don't know, 700 BCs where kings would have these harem of women just to play with them. This is how, how life has turned for them. Hearing the story of... of what life is like in Afghanistan today, the, the, the pain and, and suffering and oppression that, that so many are living under, um, especially during a time when, uh, you know, the eyes of the international community, the eyes of the world are, are drawn elsewhere largely, right? So much focus on, on the suffering in, in Ukraine and in the Middle East. And, and um, it seems like Afghanistan isn't in the headlines like it was Im immediately after the the withdrawal and, and the fall of the government. And um, what would you say to 
leaders in, in countries in the world about what, what more they could be doing to help, to help the people that you've described who, who are there living under those conditions? Well, I, I would just like to say that by closing your eyes and shutting your ears, well, this, this, this situation isn't going to be revolved and, and it's uh, resolved and it's not going to go away. What I'm going to say that here we talked about more about the women's rights aspect, but when you go look at this in a larger scale in the international security level, um, this is like a cancer and this is like a coronavirus, which is spreading quite fast and very, you know, it's taking over. And, and if not for the sake of these women, but for the sake of your own country's safety, just open your eyes, open your ears and take action now before it's too late. So much of what what other countries are trying to do, you know, whether whether it's trying to pressure the Taliban to to change its behavior to respect human rights, um, but but so much of the focus is also on on alleviating the suffering of of the people, the regular people in Afghanistan, and those two things are are hard to do together, and they're sometimes in tension with with the Taliban currently as as the government. How should we think about balancing those two things, how to, to help the people of Afghanistan, but at the same time encourage the Taliban to change, or how should we think about that? Well, um, I know it's a little bit too late to have leverage on Taliban by the international community, because when they could have the leverage and when they when we were shouting and screaming that please listen to us and don't do this, um, they did not listen to us. It's like, how are you going to have leverage on a group where, to whom you are sending 40 millions a week in cash? Um, and how are you going to make them listen to you when after each of your conferences, which is held you know, to resolve this issue, they issue five more degrees on restricting the women, on depriving the women of their right, and then yet again you go back to them and sit with them and send them money. I understand that uh, it's my people who are suffering, and of course I would, I would not want them to suffer. I know that we have to keep the humanitarian aspects separate from the uh, other issues. But here in my country, it's, it's very interconnected. You cannot separate the human rights from women's rights. It's the same issue. And, if you're, and, and you, even the humanitarians, you're sending this money, but the country is falling rapidly below the poverty line. There are kids, I mean, millions of people on the verge of starvation. Then where is this money going on? It's not that Taliban... Apart from what Taliban, you know, receiving from the international community, what's happening on the ground that Taliban are charging three times more the taxes from the common people, a person who cannot, you know, earn a one day bread for the family. There, there are taxes imposed on the, the, on the citizen that they're just extorting this money. Where, where is all this money going? Of course, it's going to the terrorism. How are you supporting a group which has launched 10,000 madrasas? You know what? We had few of these madrasas in Pakistan, and the result is Taliban in Afghanistan. They took over an entire country, and the result is Al-Qaeda. And, and we know that the, the, what's happening in Middle East is the same situation from these madrasas, extremism. This is where all it, 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 it happens. So Madras, imagine in these are those religious schools, right? Where that yes, that training. any religious school where, where they try to, you know, orchestrate the children's mind is dangerous. Any religion, I, I'm a bit due respect to all religions. I do practice Islam, but I do not practice it the way these terrorists do. I want to believe that my religion is the religion of the peace, but these. These goons wants to say that our religion is to kill, our religion is to wage war, our religion is to kill anybody who does not believe what we believe. 
So imagine 10,000 children and there is money for these madrasas, but when it comes to girls' school, when it comes to schools, actual education system, they say we do not have enough fundings. Teachers have been, you know, a lot of people lost their jobs. These teachers were earning from these, these jobs. They say we do not have enough teachers. How, are you, how, how do you have enough people for the madrasas and not for, for the education system? So I think the, 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 the world needs to take a closer look on this. If you do not want a repeat of October 7, if you do not want a repeat of 9-11, if you do not want extremism to be to come, you know, just knocking on your door, do not ignore the situation in Afghanistan. It is it is not only a women's right catastrophe; it is a human right catastrophe. It is you are you just give a country of forty with forty million population for this extremist for this terrorist to grow. This this they it has become you know Afghanistan has gained the title of. Bora Bora for the terrorists now. Daesh is there, Jaish is there, Lashkari Tayyiba is there, Haqqani is there, the Chechen extremists are there, the Chinese are there, the Russians are there. So imagine, this is my country which is being, you know, torn apart, and this is my people who are paying the price of, you know, this, this, this wrong, wrong policies from the, from the world. And this is a very dangerous situation, and it needs an immediate uh, attention. Well, you make, you make a powerful case for, for why Afghanistan matters, uh, why it matters to the people there, of course, and, and why it matters to the world. Um, you also uh, spoke to something you, you, you touched on earlier in the podcast, that, that women's rights are human rights. And of course, the attacks that we've seen on women's rights recently are, are certainly not limited to Afghanistan. You've spoken out also about uh, the assault on, on women's rights in Iran in recent years. Yes. Um, what do you see as, as kind of the linkages between not only the, the, the oppression of women in these societies, but what are the similarities across those that are, are fighting for, for women's rights across these societies against oppressive regimes? Well, it's, uh, it's very simple. It's uh, political uh, um, religion, or I would say political Islam. It's not the real Islam that we are talking about. They're politicizing uh, the religion in order to, you know, the dictators are using religion as a tool to oppress their uh, people and then to rule on them. What's happening in Iran is, uh, it's, it's, you know, um, uh, somewhat, Iran is a little bit advanced country than Afghanistan. They have more chance of education, growth, uh, you know, their culture is still alive. They have beautiful country, beautiful cultures, but what we are seeing there is horrible, horrible situation that women are being, you know, targeted, attacked, blinded, killed and executed for just, you know, a piece of cloth on their hair. When I, when I uh, talk of women's rights and human rights, I, 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 I support the woman who wants to wear a hijab by her own will, and I support the woman who doesn't want to wear this piece of cloth. It's their choice. When I say women's rights, it's the right of women on her own life, on her own decision, on her own body. In Afghanistan, on the past 20 years, a job, a job wasn't compulsory. But because of the society, women were used to it, so they would wear it. But in Kabul, you would see women not wearing hijab, driving, going to the studio, watching football. But in Iran, it's not the case. Women are not allowed in the stadiums. Women are, we, they are forced to have to wear this piece of cloth. As long as you have this piece of cloth, it's fine. But women of Iran has come to this understanding that this is not a piece of cloth. This is this is the way that they want to control women, because they could not control their education, they could not control their growth, and now they they want to control them with this piece of cloth. So I think it's very common. It's not only in Iran. I, the moment I arrived in Poland, we had a similar case with the abortion here. That a young woman died because she was refused abortion, even though her her baby had died in her womb. And since then, there are movements going on 
that if women are in need and their lives are threatened, they should have these choices. Um, you know, women are struggling across the globe. What I learned in this past two and a half years, uh, it's just that it's on different levels. In my country, we are just, we, all we want is, you know, to breathe, to exist, to live. And when I come to, to, the, to the Europe and when I come to the U.S., I see that, no, it's, women are struggling. I still see on higher levels this, you know, this, this, this imbalance situations. Uh, but as I, I, I'm learning a lot. And, and I don't want to speak on the topics without proper knowledge. But I see that women are not completely free and, and, and they do not have their rights 100% anywhere in the world, unfortunately. Well, we've spoken today about, about so many um, very difficult but very important topics. And, and I want to end on, on a note of, of optimism, uh, hopefully. Um, what yeah. could you articulate? What's your hope? for the future of Afghanistan? Well, uh, I just hope that um, my people, my sisters in Afghanistan, and of course in Iran as well, because it's very close to my heart, um, we survive and we come out victorious from this gender apartheid, which is being imposed on women in Iran and Afghanistan. And, uh, I certainly hope that one day all of us could go back in our country, walk on our streets and be free of all these religious extremists and have a free and fair life in our own countries. Well, we always uh, end our Reaganism podcast with a lightning round where we ask our guests to share their favorite President Reagan quote or speech or a book. Uh, do you have anything to share, Neil Afar, with our audience today? Um, well, as freedom is very close to my heart, so I would share this quote from President Reagan, where he says that freedom is never more than one generation extension uh, if we didn't pass it to our children through our bloodstream, which I think is very, very important in this time for all of us, especially for us women in Afghanistan, that we pass this uh, freedom to our bloodstream to the next generation and preach freedom and, and, and exercise it. Certainly something that you and, and your family and the people of Afghanistan know all too well, the power of freedom and the idea that we can't take it for granted. Neela Faro Yubi, thank you so much for being with us on Reaganism today. Thank you so much. We hope you enjoyed this episode of Reaganism. New episodes premiere weekly every Monday on YouTube and all podcast streaming platforms. If you like this episode, be sure to let us know and share with a friend.